Welcome everyone and thank you for joining me today as we talk about a leadership challenge solved, moving from chaos to clarity. I'm so excited you hear, you're here and I'm really looking forward to sharing more about three important topics. So I've been working with leaders for over two decades. I have a master's in organizational leadership, right for Culture University, and was a founder and past president of ACMP. But that's really not as important as you. Each one of you represent the leaders who are making an impact every day. You are the amazing people we work with to ensure your messages get heard, your ideas are adopted, and your people are following you into a new future. And today, as we tackle the topic of moving from chaos to clarity, we're going to talk about three very simple concepts that are incredibly important. Today's webinar is gonna give you a different perspective, a simple point of view on three important leadership topics. So over the next hour, we're gonna talk about strategy, culture, and change. Now, if you have any questions, please be sure to use the chat to speak up. My team's monitoring the messages and we'll make sure that we answer your questions here or uh, if we're not able to address it in our conversation today, we'll make sure that you're able to get your questions answered in a follow-up message. So this brings me to information overload. And I'm guessing that many of you understand you are bombarded with information on a daily basis. In fact, we were looking at a research study at the University of California, San Diego. And for those of you who live in the US, did you know that you're consuming 3.6 zettabytes of data every day? That's astounding. And in fact, before we explored this, I didn't even realize there was such a thing as a zettabyte. So in the midst of that data overload, leaders like each one of you need to communicate vision, mission, strategy. You're working to ensure that projects get done, that the daily work of the organization occurs, and what happens to those messages? Well, it gets lost in the daily drama of life, or as we often say, all the important leadership messages that you're sharing with your people get mixed up and twisted in the change distortion field. This is the noise that's in everybody's minds from that information overload. And it's really interesting. Uh, a few years ago, we were working with a company where they realized they had more priorities, more important projects than they had capacity for. So the leaders very wisely took a look at every single one of the projects, evaluated what was most important, as you do during prioritization, and they decided on the top 10 things the company needed focus. They shared that message out with the rest of the organization, but something really interesting happened. Although the leaders thought they were really clear on their top priorities and what mattered most, nobody else in the organization understood that. In fact, there was a project that was killed, meaning people were not supposed to be working on it anymore. But somehow in that information overload, in that change distortion field where all of the messages that leaders are clearly trying to communicate get lost, nobody heard that that project was supposed to end. And in fact, it's really interesting because although the leaders had prioritized and said, here's the top projects, what everybody heard was they're all important and we need to work on all of them. And so that very important leadership work of prioritization was lost on the organization. So what to do? Well, this is one of my absolute favorite graphics. It represents what I see as a challenge in many organizations and is a contributing factor to the frustration many of you feel. People are moving in lots of different directions. Decisions are being made that may or may not be in the best interest of the organization. 
Perhaps there's challenges with employee morale, engagement, et cetera. And as a leader, you know the power and potential of a team, the power and potential of an organization focused in the same direction. Because when people know how to contribute, how to prioritize, and how to make decisions, you can accomplish far more with the same exact limited resources you have when everybody's focused in the same direction and moving toward the same purpose. So this is a leadership challenge, how we move from a place where everybody's going in different directions to a clear, focused future. So I was working with a client on some culture challenges. Now, one of the things we feel is really important is measuring culture. And there are some extraordinary tools that help leaders get clear um, measurement and metrics on exactly where their culture is so that as they do work, they're able to remeasure and see the progress they're making. So we were working with a client and in the culture survey, it showed that while employees understood their day-to-day -day goals, they were very fuzzy, very unclear on how what they do every day supported or connected to the strategy. So on the survey, again, it says from the goals area, I know what I'm supposed to do every day, which is excellent. It means that they were working on what they were supposed to be working on because they were clear. But what they were missing is that connection to the greater vision and strategy. So we were sitting in a room with a team tackling the survey results because while the survey results matter and share a lot of really important details, you need to understand the why behind the what of the data. So we were discussing with this team, why is it that you weren't clear on the strategy? It's pretty important for people to know where you're going. Well, as we were having this conversation, I remember it like it was yesterday. Jason raised his hand and said, I just want to know how to win. And he proceeded to get into a, a discussion around football, which is kind of appropriate considering the Super Bowl is going to be happening in just a couple of days from now. But he said, you know, when somebody's playing football, you know what the score is, you know what the game is, and you know how to win. He said, I'm so confused about the strategy. I don't know how to win. And I thought that was a beautiful way of understanding strategy. If you don't know what game you're playing, then you don't know how to win. And fundamentally, everybody wants to know that they're contributing to something bigger than themselves, that what they do every day matters, and that that is actually helping um, advance the cause of the organization. So that brings us to the first leadership topic we're tackling. And that is strategy. So imagine walking out onto this playing field, take a close look around, what do you see? And in your hands, you have this equipment. That's pretty helpful. But imagine instead, instead of that football, you walk out onto the playing field with this equipment. While that's great and excellent and exactly what you need if you're skating out onto an ice rink, it doesn't do a whole lot of good on a baseball diamond. And quite frankly, that football doesn't do a whole lot of good on a baseball diamond. So if your employees or the people on your team don't know what game they're playing, they don't know how to show up. They don't know what equipment they need, and they don't know how to prepare or train to be successful. So very simply, ask yourself the question, does your strategy ensure your people know what game you're playing? So I was working with another organization and they had similar results on their culture survey. There was a dismal level of clarity and alignment about the strategy. Now the CEO here was particularly frustrated. He said at every single town hall, I review the strategy. I clearly set the direction. Why is it that these people don't get 
our strategy because I tell them about it all the time. Well, here's what was interesting. So as we did the conversations with the employees, again, understanding the why behind the what of the culture data, what they explained was absolutely the CEO came to them regularly and shared the strategy. But what was interesting is that the pictures he used and the words that were describing the strategy changed every single time. Now, the CEO thought he was being really clear and he was just helping it be more um, specific as he adjusted the pictures and the illustrations and the graphics. But what he didn't realize is that as those pictures changed and as he changed the words he was using, he actually made it more complex and the employees lost sight of what game they were playing. Initially, they thought they were pivoting, that that was the strategy, but then that went away. And then they were focusing on the core and then that went away. So what are the words that are being used and the pictures that are helping to explain what the strategy is? As a leader, our encouragement is being very specific, very clear and consistent as you're communicating strategy. But in addition to those words and visuals, another really critical dimension of strategy is how you keep score. Oops. So as you look at the scoreboard, I'd love to hear from you in the chat box. What game is being played? So when you're looking here, you've got the home team and the visitor team. That's pretty standard from game to game. We're in the fourth quarter, third down and 10 to go. What does that tell you? Well, for me, as I look at it, that's playing football. Now we look at this scoreboard. What game are we playing here? So we've got balls and strikes and out. We've got innings and we've got home and guest. So if you look carefully, my guess is this is probably a baseball game that's going on. But what if this was the scoreboard that was used to track and, and measure the success of the team that was playing football? That would be pretty confusing. So you can see this is pretty simple. When you're sharing strategy, one of those essential and incredibly important leadership topics, your strategy must make it clear what game you're playing and how, you're, how you keep score. Because your team and your organization want to know how to win. They want to know how the work they do each and every day contributes and makes a difference. And they won't understand that if, if you've got people showing up to play hockey and some people showing up to play baseball, some people showing up to play football, you're going to end up with those folks moving in all different directions because they have very different understandings of the game they're playing and even how they keep score and how they might win. So once you, un once you know the game that you're playing and you're very clear on how you're keeping score, it's important to consider the culture. Culture can feel like a really complex subject. We'll tackle the definition in just a minute, but I'd like you to reflect on any team that you've either read, observed, or even participated on. Each team has its own unique feel. And although you're looking at a football team on the screen right now, I want to think back to the Chicago Cubs. I happen to live in Chicago. And if you recall, when they won the World Series, it was a particularly impactful and exciting time here in the city. In fact, it had been decades since the team had approached a World Series. And so there was a lot of celebrating. But as I reflected on the Chicago Cubs winning the World Series, one of the things I observed as I read about them, about the players, about the leaders, 
was the importance of culture and how that contributed to their success and enabled them to win. You see, there is people reflecting about how they worked closely together, how they had a common vision, values, goals, but it was beyond just, yes, we want to win, because isn't that the goal of every team? But they wanted to win it all in the World Series, and they went about it in a very specific way, which was around their culture. In fact, and I don't have a picture of this, but there was a unique structure even in terms of the way in which they built their clubhouse. So even the environment shifted the way that they interacted and the culture that existed within the team. And I believe that contributed significantly to their success and their ability to win. Now, if you look at this past year, they went from winning the World Series to not doing so well. And there were some very specific things that happened, and we're not going to get into the um, uh, baseball analysis here, but specific things that happened that impacted and, and took away from that culture. So whether you're playing football, playing baseball, playing hockey, whatever metaphor you want to use, um, culture really matters, not only in being successful in that sport, but also in the game of business. So now that we talked about it sort of at a high level, connecting it back to the game we're playing and how we win, this description of culture comes from Dr. Edgar Schein, who I believe in many ways is a, is a huge contributing factor to the way that we understand organizational culture today. Now, as I was uh, in my organizational leadership studies, this particular explanation rocked my world. Because up to that time, you know, I understood culture as sort of like those factors around you, and I, I believed that it really mattered. But it wasn't until I understood that culture has multiple levels that it really became clear to me why sometimes changes are so difficult to make. Because you can have the best change methodology in the world, but if you're not understanding the deeper level of culture, it will inhibit and prevent the success of that change despite the best methodology and the best intentions of the team leading the project. So as you think about culture, the other thing that's interesting is that people often confuse the things they see around them to be the culture. And this is why I think it's interesting you hear about, oh, there's these fabulous high tech companies and they have nap pods and they have lunch rooms where they serve all kinds of fantastic food. And that's wonderful. And that may contribute to the type of culture they have, but it's more than just what you see around you. So there's a level of what you observe and that can give you a lot of clues, but there's something deeper than that. Now, values are not directly observable as the things that you would see around you, like artifacts. And the other thing that's interesting about values is there's often a difference between the stated values, so it's written on the walls, and the operating values, which is what you observe in the halls. A really critical task of leadership is to ensure that actually what's stated and what's in operation are actually aligned, that they match up. But organizational values are frequently expressed through norms. And what I mean by norms is sometimes referred to as the unwritten rules, the things that we just understand. So when we walk into a meeting, is everybody quiet and focused on preparation? Or is there a norm where we check in and chat about what happened over the weekend or maybe the sports team that's local to our organization? So those unwritten rules are the things that you learn as you start as, at an organization and they're part of culture. But that's not all. To really understand culture, we have to get at the deepest level. That is the level of fundamental assumptions. And this is where the next chart is really helpful in understanding why this matters, where culture comes from. So as I like to say, belief drives behavior. And then behavior is what accomplishes results. So if you want to increase effectiveness, well, effectiveness is the capability to produce the desired result. 
every single individual in a team, in an organization has beliefs and those beliefs get exhibited through their behaviors. If you're going to change behavior, you have to understand and change beliefs. So this is what's interesting about change because often change is a directed at behaviors. We communicate things, we train and we teach on behaviors, but you cannot create lasting change without shifting beliefs. So in order to understand, again, we're talking about three simple leadership uh, concepts here. We started with strategy. Now we're talking about culture. Culture matters because it exists. It's present in every team and in every organization. So it's not like a leader wakes up one day and says, you know, I think I'm going to work on culture today. I mean, that could be great, but it's not as if it didn't exist and, and magically because they're going to start focusing on it, it's going to change. The reality is you can have a culture that's intentional because you've decided and how it needs to occur in order to support your strategy, or you can have a hypocritical culture. And many of you have probably worked in organizations where leaders talk about what the culture should be, or maybe they don't talk about culture, but they talk about values and how important they are. And then at the same time, you see and observe them doing something contrary to what they just said. That's a hypocritical culture. Um, and finally, you can just have one that exists, some that's, that's just there, has no attention, but it's always present. So culture really matters. And the question for you as we're considering strategy, culture, and change is thinking about what are the underlying beliefs? So the values are the things that are often stated, but fundamentally, what is it that people believe that drives their behavior? And then the next question, do those beliefs actually support the results you want? Now, I'd like to share another story with you. This comes from an organization and they were they were a, an acquiring company. The leader had been recognized in numerous articles for the incredible culture that he created. It was a warm, inviting culture. When you walked in to the office, the thing that immediately hit you was in bright, colorful letters all over the walls, the values of the organization. If you continued walking through the office, there was a beautiful timeline painted about all the significant accomplishments they had achieved as a company in the break room. Actually, I think it was in the office supply room. There was a magazine with the CEO on the cover and a story about what a great culture he created and the amazing organization that was there. You continued walking through and there was just sort of a buzz uh, throughout the organization um, as you walked and you just observed the people working and how they interacted. You move on into the lunchroom and there was cozy couches and snacks everywhere, televisions with things going on. So it was an environment that um, created a certain feel. Now, as I said, there's multiple levels to culture. So what I saw gave me some clues, but then we had to go a little bit deeper to understand, well, what are the beliefs driving the behaviors that kind of create what I see around me? And so one of their values was open, honest, direct conversation, which means you just tell it like it is. When you show up and you've got something to say, you say it. And that was very accepted in their environment. So fast forward a little bit we're working with another company that they had acquired. So the acquiring company has this very open, direct, friendly environment, and they acquire a company that's based in Manhattan. It's a financial company. They work long, hard hours. They value attention to detail and excellence to the nth degree. Everything they do is checked and double checked. When you join the organization, you start at the very lowest levels and work your way up because you need to learn and understand exactly what needs done at every point in the organization. So they have an incredibly strong culture that values this excellence and hard work. Now imagine the CEO from the acquiring company walking in to this target company 
and saying, hi, everybody, welcome to the organization. You know, we have such a great culture. In fact, you know, every Monday we do yoga and, you know, we're going to tell it like it is and we're going to have, um, you know, a, a great culture here and we're so excited that you're part of it. And he spends an hour explaining to this new company what a great culture that, that they're about to take part in and how they should be really excited. Well, you can imagine that created some pretty significant culture flashpoints because the values of the acquiring company and the behaviors and the culture, those underlying beliefs supported exactly who they were and helped them be successful. Um, they were in software development and they needed to be agile and those beliefs of, hey, we're gonna figure it out as we go along and make it happen, serve them well and help them achieve their strategy. But what they didn't understand was that that successful culture in their organization wasn't necessarily the culture that was needed at the other organization. Going back to strategy, so the game they were playing at the acquiring company was software development, was data, was selling uh, data sets to companies. And the strategy or the game they were playing at the target company was about precise, detailed, executed campaigns for top of the line blue chip customers. Very different games, which means very different cultures and very different ways to win. So this is an important uh, idea when it comes to culture, that it's multiple levels. So you need to understand those underlying beliefs and assumptions. And those underlying beliefs and assumptions need to support and drive the strategy that you're accomplishing. It needs to help you win the game and play to win. So anytime a leader is looking at shifting strategy and going in a new direction, one of the key things they need to evaluate is, is that culture actually going to support the results, the strategy that you want to achieve? All right, now moving on to the last simple concept is change. And so I believe change is, an, is just a fundamental part of every leader's role because part of leadership is seeing into the future and helping people get from where they are to that future, that new direction, that new um, uh, differentiated environment that they are playing in and kind of directionally how they're going to live into this VUCA world that's complex and changing and leaders see that. They see what needs to happen in order to move into this new and complex future. So the idea is that leaders lead change. It's part of what they do. And in order to do that, sometimes it's a challenging journey. So John Cotter has a fabulous definition where he talks about change leadership and he defines it that you are inspiring, or excuse me, you are defining the future. So that's kind of the vision. Where is it that you're going? What does success look like? And you can see here from this picture, that's moving up to the top of the mountain. That's what success is. So you've made that very clear in setting the vision. The next piece is alignment. And if you think back to the picture we started with at the very beginning of this webinar, that's helping people moving from all different directions, going all different ways to, I understand the vision. I understand what game we're playing, how we win. So I'm aligned. And then the last piece as a leader is the inspiration. So how do you help people see the future that's bigger than the problems in front of them? So again, vision, alignment, and inspiration are key. Now, another important um, definition I find for leaders is getting clear on the fact that there's a difference between change and transition. And it's interesting because as we talk about change management, some leaders are like, ah, I don't need to bother with that. And I'm like, yeah, you're absolutely right. You have the capability as a leader to make change. You can reorganize, you can set a new strategy, you can initiate a new project. All of that is external change. However, in order to achieve and accomplish the results you want from that change, 
Is it important that the people impacted by that change actually buy in and support it? And usually at that point, the leader says, well, yeah, that's probably pretty important. And so what I like to explain is that there's a difference between making the change, like doing the thing, creating the change, and actually getting the people that are impacted by that change to go through the transition and adopt, engage, believe in, buy in, whatever your uh, language is. Um, it's helping each person impacted by that change, that external thing, to buy into it so that they support it and you get the results you're trying to accomplish. This is why change management is such a challenge because you can create the change very easily, but the transition is a lot more challenging. And so I like to say, change happens one person at a time. It's a way that you as a leader need to pay attention to every single individual, which is a challenge, but transition occurs in each person. And then collectively as each person changes, that's what helps transform the organization. So that is the beauty, the power, and the importance of excellent change management is that they are the processes and approaches that you need to help you be successful in ensuring that as each person moves through, the, through their transition process, that they adopt and experience the change as you need it to, to achieve your results. So one of the things we realized um, as we were paying attention to change and understanding the um, importance of helping people move through their transition was that there's a ton of information on change management. There's methodologies, there's great insight, fabulous research. But what we saw missing was the fact that there's not a whole lot written, a lot of tools provided to help leaders do their job. And a leader's job when it comes to change is being a good sponsor. And what that means is that you are actively involved and engaged in all the changes going on, doing your part to help people remember the vision. Where is it that we're going with this change? That they remain aligned and doing what they need to do to be successful in that change and finally inspired. So all of those things are critical, but as a leader, sometimes that's really tough. Meaning back to that information overload, you've got just as much going on in your world as your people do. So how do you on a daily basis, make sure that you're actively practically serving as an excellent change sponsor. How do you do change leadership well? So we created the change leader toolkit. And in this, there's four simple pages. You can see three of them here. And the idea is that you capture every single change going on in your organization that impacts your team or your people. Now you might think, oh, well, I know everything that's going on. But you know, it's interesting. We found as we've worked with leaders, that's not always the case. In fact, we experienced, there was one situation where we were sitting down with the VP of operations and we had gone out and we did this work where we went and gathered a list of everything that was going on in the organization that was impacting her people. She had about um, 800 team members in her group. And she said, you know, I know what's going on. So we started going down the list and she was like, hey, I didn't know about this. Where did that come from? And it turned out that there was at least a half a dozen different changes that were um, going to be impacting her organization. And not only were they impacting her organization, but they were about to, <laughs> they were about to happen during the absolute busiest time of the year. And if they did impact them during the busiest time of the year, that meant that some of the goals and some of the results she need to, needed to accomplish in her customer service areas were not going to happen. So just by taking inventory and cataloging all the changes, she was able to help shift around some of the, the change and the impact. So that's the first step is really understanding that. Then as a leader, you need to understand, well, what is the impact? 
because in order for you to serve as an excellent change leader and do your job well, you need to know more about the change. So we created a, a simple template just for you to capture that information. Once those things are complete, then you can do your weekly change planner. And the concept here, very simply, is that you would each and every day do something, one small thing that enables you to serve as a better change leader. It's kind of like whatever you, you get, whatever you focus on. So our goal is to help leaders focus on the changes they're responsible for sponsoring and leading through this change leader toolkit. And you can see here, there's a link. We'll also provide the link for you at the end of the webinar. Um, if you'd like to download that and access it, it's available for you. And we'd love for you to try it out, give us some feedback and, um, and see how that works for you. So again, the change catalog, as I mentioned, tracks the changes that are going on, how they impact people. Then we've got the change success brief, which, which defines um, what is success? What does it look like for this change and the essential success factors? And finally, a tracker or a way of capturing a daily action that can ensure success um, as you lead all the variety of changes. So your opportunity, and again, our goal was simplifying and helping you move from chaos to clarity. And it's done as we propose in these very three very simple steps, being clear on the game that you're playing, and not only the game you're playing, but how you win, and that's your strategy, how you're playing that game, so the culture that you have, and finally, what it takes to win which is the change. So moving from where you are to where you need to go. Once you're clear on your strategy, you've set your culture, you make your change, then you can achieve success. So I love this quote from Abraham Lincoln, which is, again, you can read it here, but if you wanna create a successful future, um, you can predict that by creating it. And we would suggest that you will increase your growth by a clear, simple strategy. You will increase your effectiveness if you use the lever of, of culture and finally increase your influence through change. So before I move on to the final slide, um, I just wondered if there's any questions that, that we wanna tackle and then we'll get wrapped up and give you some time back in your day. So if there's any questions, um, so Catherine said she'd love to have the documents. Um, we are going to provide the link for that and we'll also follow up with it. Randy, you asked a great question. How do you determine the real underlying beliefs for a large organization? So in a large organization, there's multiple levels of culture and there's also culture, which is overall, and then subcultures. So the real underlying beliefs, um, I mentioned about using a culture survey. There's a variety of them. I highly recommend that you investigate if you're going to use a survey, making sure that you've got um, time-tested research behind whatever tool that you're using. There's a lot of places that are now offering um, various culture tools, but they're really not proven. So make sure that you're using um, a survey and then use that to point to specific areas where you can have conversations and enable you to uncover those deeper beliefs. Um, the tool that we use that we find extremely, um, extremely helpful and for the reason that it actually does address culture um, is human synergistics. So they have a tool set and the reason that they're that they're been useful to us, again, we use a variety of different tools, but their particular tool set gets at that level of underlying beliefs and assumptions. So many of the surveys out there actually just are measuring climate and not getting into culture. And if you'd like to talk a little bit more about that, I'm happy to share um, some more on climate versus culture and why, um, what the difference is and why some surveys are only looking at one dimension and not getting at the deeper level of culture. Now, again, you said, okay, 
I've got a large organization. How do I understand those underlying beliefs? So let me give you an example. Um, we're working with a large NGO in, um, in DC and they're going through a transformation. So a big change. And remember, I said that culture needs to support strategy. So if you're transforming, you need to pay attention. What is the culture we have? And then what is the culture that we need for the future? And that's one of the ways that human synergistics tools is very helpful because it actually enables the organization to define what is the ideal? What do I need? And then it helps you map the gaps between what you have and what you need. And the other piece is that it gives the picture of the overall organization, but also gets at the subcultures. Now, what do I mean by that? Think about in an organization where you might go from the accounting department or finance area um, over to customer service, and you can feel and experience a difference. Now, everybody may work for the same company, and so there's overall organizational culture and values, but there's also subcultures within that organization. So determining the underlying beliefs needs to happen at a variety of different levels, and it needs to be done in the service of whatever, you know, whatever you're trying to accomplish. So if it's to understand those underlying beliefs to make a change, then you want to remember who's being impacted and address those particular um, that target audience for the beliefs and assumptions they have to help make a change. And I'd like to give you one other example, um, very practically from a change point of view on why that matters. So in this particular story, the client was recognizing that there was um, a scale of economies by consolidating some of the functions that were done out in field sales offices, okay? So there was um, specific activities, you know, supporting their customers, um, doing some underwriting calculations, different things that was occur were occurring out in the field offices. And they decided to move from that decentralized um, office-centered approach to pooling in the various activities that can be done um, more effectively or cost-effectively in a centralized fashion. Okay, so, and, and it's very basic, the change itself was moving from uh, decentralized to centralized for some specific areas. Okay, so that's the change. And then we had the change team that was working on the project. Now they were very frustrated at one point, and they came to us and said, ah, these people are being so resistant. And they were saying, they just don't want to change, and I don't understand why. And we started dr drilling into it because while it's true that maybe they were experiencing resistance, it doesn't mean that's because they didn't want to change. There was something deeper going on. So back to your question, Randy, how do you determine the underlying beliefs? Um, I see it's an art and a science. You know, we talked about the survey, but it's also paying attention to those deeper reasons. So in this case, we started talking to the leaders of the various offices. You know, are you really opposed to this change? You know, what's going on here? And through our conversations, what we found out were two things. Number one, their experience of what was being provided to their clients did not live up to the levels of excellence that they believed were important. So they did not trust the new centralized services to deliver to their customers what was necessary. So that was number one. But the other really intriguing thing was that they believed the value, the very reason that their customers worked with them was because they personally handled all of these dif different functions that were being centralized. So in the past, their customers would work directly with them to solve problems, and now they were supposed to call a hotline. Well, that works great, you know, much more cost effective, all those things, but their underlying belief was that the value and the very reason that customers do business with me was because I do these things. So you can see that even though they might say, yes, I agree with this change, I buy into it. And, you know, we follow all the communication protocols and, and go through all the training that as long as they had that belief that their job needed to continue delivering to, to these customers, these very important services, they were going to be at odds with the change that needed to happen.
So rather than just say, you're being resistant, we need to implement some resistance management. What we actually did was started having conversations and shifting their beliefs around how they delivered value to the customers. So hopefully that was helpful, Randy. Thanks for the great question. And um, anything else from the audience before we close? Well, one thing I did want to mention, and I don't know that we have a slide for this, we are going to be doing another webinar in March, March 13th, you'll get some information on that. And that webinar is going to talk about the intersection between culture and change. You've already had a bit of a preview here where we were talking about um, the importance of culture and how it can um, enhance or inhibit change. So we're going to get into that next, uh, next month. Yeah, I guess it is February. Imagine that. And, um, and we hope you can join us then. So um, I want to thank you to all of our participants. I'd love to connect with you if we aren't already connected. The link here is for the Change Leader Toolkit. You can see that. And then if you have any questions, um, please let me know. So again, the next webinar we're going to be holding is March the 13th at noon central time. And we will provide that information for those of you who are interested. So thanks so very much to all of you who joined. Um, we appreciate your time. And if there's any follow-up questions you have, be sure to email change at brightonleadership.com.